Hello and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. <laughs> In today's episode, we'll be continuing our journey along the 236 mile long M6 motorway. Last week, we covered the M6 from junctions one up to junction 13, which you'll find on the south side of Stafford. And that's where we're gonna kick things off this week, except I've come into Stafford itself to take a look at the Stafford Castle, which is on your right when you're going up the M6 between junctions 13 and 14. Originally, it was a timber fortress that was built in 1100 AD by the Normans. It wouldn't be until 1347 that a stone structure was first constructed. In the 17th century, the castle fell into a state of disrepair, having been abandoned by its owners, and it was soon after demolished. It was rebuilt in the early 1800s, but once again abandoned when the owner at the time ran out of money to complete the project. So it was rebuilt again, this time by somebody else who demolished everything that was there and built what we see today on the previous building's foundations. In more modern times, the castle was once again left abandoned, but in the 1960s it was handed over to the local council who spent a bit of time restoring it, and in 1988 the castle opened as a visitor centre. The earthworks that the castle sit on is said to be one of the oldest examples of Norman earthworks in the country, so if you want to see a pile of really old soil, this is the place to come. A short distance from the castle and still between junctions 13 and 14 is where we find the Doxey Highway Maintenance Depot. At the time of the M6's construction, the plan for this site was for it to be a motorway service station as well as a small maintenance depot. They built the maintenance depot and in doing so realised that the slip road design was less than ideal, being very short with a tight turn. In the 90s, when they finally decided they wanted to build a service station, this site was ruled out immediately due to the slip road design because they weren't safe enough under modern motorway standards. Today, the site is used as a larger maintenance depot and a DVSA HGV checkpoint. Between junctions 14 and 15, we find Yarnfield Lane crossing over the M6, and it's also here that we find a secret junction. As usual, it's used by emergency service vehicles or maintenance vehicles, but this one is perhaps unique because it's got its own sort of mini slip roads that go underneath the bridge before you exit the motorway. If we follow Yarnfield Lane and head through Yarnfield Village, we'll eventually arrive at the Sinnerton training camp. This 1200 acre site was built between 1939 and 1941 as a Royal Ordnance factory where ammunition was manufactured. When it was fully operational, there were about 1700 buildings across the site operated by up to 18 and a half thousand workers. Due to the dangerous nature of ammunition manufacture, all of the roads around the site are built to a very high standard using grit-free asphalts with orders to keep all of the roads clean at all times. This was to prevent any unwanted sparks creating a catastrophe. Speaking of catastrophes, HS2 will be coming through this way and there are plans to construct a new viaduct that will carry HS2 over the M6 just up from Yarnfield Lane. This is one of those moments where I was writing the script, but in person I've no idea what's going to happen. We might find an empty field or we might find a completed viaduct. We just don't know. I've had a quick look around and there are many vehicle tracks, but no signs of any construction starting. Although that said, wasn't this part of HS2 cancelled or something? I don't know, probably will be, let's be honest. Because of HS2's routing through the area, part of the nearby Sinnerton training camp might be turned into a garden village following proposals that were put forward in 2019. But it seems only a small section of the site will be turned into housing. I haven't found any plans to upgrade any of the surrounding infrastructure. So I'm sure that'll work out well. Next up, we're going to try and find what appears to be an abandoned bridge over the M6. It's somewhere behind me. Just a bit of backstory, on my travels I use the M6 a lot and I've seen this bridge several times and on the top there's what appears to be a fence or a gate but this suggests to me that it's no longer used. In any case today we're going to try and get a closer look. As you can see I made it onto the bridge. The answer as to why we've got this unused bridge might be down to the Trenton Estate that own the land this bridge connects to. When you build a motorway you can't just cut off roads or access that already existed. In one way shape or form you have to retain the access as it was before and often bridges or tunnels are built to allow for this. I believe for a while the bridge was used as pedestrian access to the Trenton Estate and its woodlands. However, following vandalism at the site, the access point on the bridge was closed because it was being used as a quick way in and out by crime types. Since then, it seems that the bridge has been abandoned, maybe forever, who knows. Junction 15 opened in 1962 and for a while it served as a temporary terminus for the M6 before it was extended to the north. The junction's design has presented a few challenges in more modern times due to its short slip roads and tight curves. There have been several proposals put forward over the years to improve the junction's layout, but none of them have come to fruition. 
The most recent of these was in 2006, and it would have seen a radical change to the junction's layout. Interestingly, as a separate proposal, the idea of extending the M6 toll road was put forward, which would have seen the M6 toll road connect with the M6 at junction 15. But none of that's happened. Between junctions 15 and 16 is Keel Services. But you might find a more cost-effective option by driving up to Junction 16 where you'll find the crew services. It's not an official service station, but it sits right on the junction, so the access is just as easy as any other. There we are, useful consumer advice, that's all it is. Looking at satellite images, there appears to be some sort of new construction underway alongside the M6 between Junctions 18 and 19. It's not clear what it is exactly, and it might even be finished by now, but if we look a short distance away, we find a very similar site, albeit this one is fully functional. Scattered around in the farmer's fields, it looks like there are some pipelines and valves of some description, but the real secret is hidden underground. This is the Stublich or Stublich gas storage facility. You'd never know that underground there are several 600 metre long gas storage caverns big enough to fit two Wembley stadiums in, and that's each of them. When the site's at full capacity, it can hold the same energy that eight nuclear power stations can produce. What's interesting is how they built it. It turns out this area has got a lot of salt. An awful lot of salt. To the point where, rather than dig out the ground, they bored a hole and sent in a load of water, allowing it to dissolve the salt over time, thus creating the underground caverns. Even though it took a few years, it was still quicker and cheaper to do this rather than excavate the ground, so the gas is now stored in underground salt caverns and it's the largest facility of its type in the UK. Junction 19 is also known as the... Junction 19 is also known as the Tambley Interchange. It opened in 1963 as a simple roundabout style junction, and that's how it stayed for ages, right up until 2016 when proposals were put forward to make improvements to the junction. Or should I say improvements? These improvements will see the construction of two connecting roads that will go over the M6 on a new bridge. Work commenced in 2020 at a cost of £43 million, and it was all finished by 2022. The question is, is was it all worth it? Well, if you use the interchange regularly, feel free to let us know. My money is on no. Junction 20 is where the M6 meets the M56 at the Lim Interchange. This complex and large interchange, when it opened in the 1960s, was a far simpler affair, mainly because the M56 didn't exist. In the 1970s, when the M56 was built, they expanded the junction to add connecting slip roads between the two motorways. And the final changes came in the 1990s following the M6's widening. It turns out that the widened motorway wouldn't fit under the original bridges at Junction 20, so they reworked the junction, turning the roundabout into a dumbbell design and building a new bridge. Just before we get to Junction 21 and the motorway crosses over the Manchester Ship Canal and the River Mersey on the 1300 metre long tailwall viaduct. There are two bridges here. The first opened in 1963 and today carries the northbound carriageway and the second opened in 1995 and carries the southbound carriageway. Its longest span is 102 metres and the bridge frequently sees speed restrictions put in place due to strong wind gusts despite its fairly low height of 30 metres. At Junction 21A we find the Croft Interchange which is where the M6 and the M62 meet and just to one side there's what's called Houghton Green Pool. The water level in this pool seems to vary according to the time of year and the weather and that's because it's not a natural lake or pool. It started as nothing more than a farmer's field before it was excavated for sand which was used in the construction of the nearby M62. Once that all came to an end the hole was left to nature and is now home to a variety of species from birds to insects. Just on your left as you pass Junction 22 is the site of the former Parkside Colliery. A lot of the coal mines that we've mentioned throughout the series have got decades if not centuries of history, but that's not the case with Parkside Colliery. You might consider it a more modern coal mine having opened in 1957. In the early 90s the coal mine would see closure, but it wasn't without a fuss. A group of four women staged a protest against the closure which saw them occupying the underground mine for four days. But it wasn't just those guys who were against the closure. Around 80 MPs signed a petition to keep the mine operational. None of this worked and the mine closed in 1993 and to prevent any further underground protests they very quickly demolished the winding towers but sort of forgot about the millions of pounds worth of equipment left down inside the mine. Rumours are that all of this equipment remains in place to this day. The site sat abandoned for many years, but in 2019 planning permission was granted to build some warehouses on the site and eventually it might be turned into some sort of rail freight terminal. Along with these new structures, there are plans to build a new road connecting these warehouses to Junction 22 of the M6. Right, I'm about to get done over by the weather. And there we are then guys, that's all we've got time for this week. I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is of course a button specifically for that. We're going to give the M6 a little bit of a break, so next week we'll be looking at a different motorway. 
Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. That would be wicked sweet awesome, and I wouldn't want you to miss out, of course. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name is John, you've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you next time for another exciting episode of Secrets of the Motorway. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. Brain. If you want